Welcome to Fort Roberdeau. I'm Major Cluggage, the local commander here at the fort, and will lead you through your tour here at Fort Roberdeau, the American Revolutionary War Fort. And we're excited to have you, and we have a little quiz that'll help you remember your trip here before and after and when you go back home. The first part is, what is the nickname of Fort Roberdeau? Well, the nickname came from the purpose of the fort. And that purpose is to produce lead. Lead was vital for what reason? To produce musket balls and rifle slugs for the Continental Army. So they found lead ore here in this beautiful sinking valley. And General Roberto heard about the lead ore deposits and being from Pennsylvania, he sponsored the expedition. So that's why they came up here was for lead. So the nickname for our fort is the lead mine fort. The second thing to remember about our fort that makes it unique, if you look at the fort logs, you'll see that they're horizontal as opposed to vertical. Because when they tried to build the fort and they tried to dig and stick logs up with a sharp point that you're used to seeing with wood forts, it didn't happen. Because the bedrock, the hard rock right under the soil is real close to the surface here. So what they ended up doing was laying a foundation of stone and stacking the logs horizontal and putting notches. So the answer to number two is horizontal logs. The third thing to remember about the fort is our diamond shaped corners and they are called bastions. And that's your vocabulary word for today, bastions. Can everybody say that? Very good, bastions. And the reason why we had bastions and you'll see them in a lot of the forts in the frontier, is they never knew how many people they would have inside the fort to defend it. So with just eight people, you could see the whole way around your fort. Because when you stick two people in each corner, the angles work out so that they can see the whole way around your fort. And in theory, nobody can sneak up on you. So those are the basic points to remember about your tour at Fort Roberdeau. But we've only just begun because inside the fort, we have rangers, a tinsmith, a frontier doctor, and you're gonna learn about life as it was in the fort back during the Revolutionary War. So remember that as we enter into the fort to begin your tour. Welcome to the inside of Fort Roberdeau. This is a, a military fort. It was a regional garrison that was built in 1778 and operated through 1780. And we actually had soldiers and rangers that became pensioned veterans of the American Revolutionary War because of their service here. And we did have a flag raising ceremony and you're gonna to get to participate with that today. So to raise the flag, we wanna think about why would you raise a flag over the fort? What is the purpose of having a flag over the fort? Does anybody have any ideas? All right, that's right. Why, by raising the flag, it shows who's in control of the fort. So if you're a Continental soldier, a local militia, or a ranger returning back, and you see the American flag over the fort, you know that we, the Americans are in control of the fort. If you come back, and there's a British flag or a King's flag over the fort, you know the Tories are in control of the fort. So that is the purpose of having the flag over the fort. Now we are going to raise the flag for today and you will know that the Americans are in control of the fort. So now we're going to raise the flag and our Rangers will come to order and I'll sing the first verse of Yankee Doodle Dandy and please help me out. One, two, three. Yankee Doodle went to town a riding on a pony. Stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. Yankee Doodle, keep it up. Yankee Doodle dandy. Mind the music and the step and with the girls be handy. Thank you. We have the flag raised over the fort. And now we're gonna start you into your rotations so you can learn about what it was like to be a soldier or a ranger in Fort Roberdeau and life on the frontier during the Revolutionary War. 
I want to welcome you to the officer's quarters. This is where the leaders of our soldiers here at Fort Roberdeau lived and conducted their work during the day. Uh, we have two groups of soldiers here. As the Major mentioned before, we have militia and we have rangers. Now out here on the frontier, there are no continental soldiers like you see in the pictures of George Washington and his blue-coated soldiers. You can see I have no uniform. The Major has no uniform. I'm a ranger. Rangers <clears throat> are also called scouts. We spend a lot of time in the woods watching for the enemy. Now the enemy consists of American Indians, uh, basically Iroquois, Shawnee, and Lenny Lenape, British Rangers from Fort Niagara, and American Loyalists who we call Tories. So our function is to keep watch on the trails around the area and in the mountains. If we see any enemies, we go around to the farms and warn the people, and they come into the fort for protection. Now, since there are no regular army soldiers out here, where would we get soldiers? The answer is very simple. The men who come into the fort are called militia. They're not rangers like we are. They're regular farmers, and some of them live in the small towns or tradesmen. They serve as soldiers. Any man between the age of 16 and 60 was required by Pennsylvania law to serve in the militia out here on the frontier. So that's where we would get our soldiers. The officers were elected. The officers were upper class. Uh, they were well-to-do. They could read and write. Not everybody can read and write in 1778. So <clears throat> they had to be able to correspond or write letters to the government and to commanders at other areas. You can see here a table. Uh, this is where they would eat their dinner or their other meals. And after dinner, they would clear everything away and this would be their work table. This is where they would make their plans for the next day. Now the officers were elected by the men. Okay, uh, that's very important to remember. And again, they would have to have certain qualifications. Uh, getting back to the Rangers, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. If you look, I am dressed like an Indian, okay, because we spend a lot of time in the woods. Rangers are frontiersmen. I wear moccasins, so I don't make a lot of noise in the woods when I walk. These are leggings. These are wool. I wear these over my linen pants because there are a lot of thorns and briars and brambles and sharp objects in the woods, which would tear my linen pants to shreds. So I have leggings on. This is a hunting shirt based on what the Indians would wear. I have a Pennsylvania long rifle. This is a one shot weapon. So I have one shot with this weapon. Now the problem is I'm pretty accurate with this, but what if I have four or five Indians coming at me at a time? I only have one shot. So I have other weapons here. I have my knife and I have my trusted tomahawk, which I can also use. Now these are used for hunting. Before the war, we would use these for hunting. You use your knife to cut a uh, game with, your tomahawk to chop wood and to pound things with. This is a powder horn which is used to load the rifle with. You have a powder horn, you have to put powder on the rifle and a ball. And as I said, you have one shot. Okay, this is a hunting pouch. I would keep my rifle balls in here, my lead musket balls, which is the reason that the fort's here, to mine lead. And over here, this is a haversack. Now, if I'm out in the woods, I 
don't want to be carrying anything fancy like <laughs> this round in the woods banging off of trees and things. It wouldn't last very long. So I have my trusty tin cup that I keep in here. And I also have a wooden bowl smaller than that. So I'm good to go. I have everything on me that I actually need. So that concludes our segment of the tour today. I hope you understand what a ranger did and what a ranger was. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Fort Roberto. One of the things I'd like to highlight today is defensive weapons at the fort. And what we have here for you is a two-pound cannon, rather small, but also extremely valuable out on the frontier. And I will just um, stress that this is a defensive weapon. They're very good here at the fort. Fort Roberto was very fortunate to have four cannons assigned to it. And cannons are expensive. They're hard to come by. Washington and his Continental Army constantly was trying to find cannon and artillery for his forces. They knew how important it was to have good guns and good cannon crews. And as anything else in the American Revolution, Americans kind of had to learn as they went. There was some knowledge of the artillery, but not highly skilled as in the British military. So for our two-pound two field piece that we have with us, we'd have four of them here at Fort Roberto, one in each of the bastions. And like I said, they're a good defensive weapon. These cannons weigh several hundred pounds, and you can't imagine trying to drag this through the woods, over downed trees, through the mud, through the muck. So they left them here at the fort. And it's not a very good idea to drag one along when you're trying to sneak up on your enemy either. They make a lot of noise. There's a lot of things that have to go along with them. But my helpers with me, my gun crew today, a gun crew should be five men. Unfortunately, in the Continental Army, you always just don't have five people. Sometimes you make do with what you have. So first and foremost, Tom is my wormer. He has the worm, which would be used to fish debris out of the gun after each and every shot. And we also have, along with us, our sponge. This is kept damp, so after each and every shot, he would have to sponge the barrel to make sure that there are no uh, smoldering embers within the breech of the gun itself. On the opposite end of his tool is his ramrod to ram each and every um, charge down the barrel. So we'll give you a quick demonstration. We need to have a gunpowder cartridge, often in a small bag. That cartridge has to be advanced, set and pushed to seat it at the muzzle of the gun. We'll ram the cartridge. And he has to seat it nice and tight in there. He's got to pack it down nice and tight. All right. Next thing we need is our shot. And today, since we have an advancing line of soldiers, we'll use grape shot, which is a small can filled with an assorted of items. It could be filled with small musket balls, it could be filled with rocks, it could be filled with glass, metal shavings, whatever. So we'll advance canister shot today or grape shot. We'll set that bag inside the muzzle of the gun. Again, our man will come up and ram that down nice and tight for us. We've got to get it tight. We've got to get the air out of it. We've got to get that big bang going on. All right. So once our gun is loaded, we would prick the vent. There's a vent hole here in the top. That, has to, that bag of powder has to be poked through so that we have access to that powder. Um, depending on what's going on, they could set a fuse in here to light with a slow match or a small amount of powder as well. Okay, And class, unfortunately, you're right in front of the gun barrel today. You would be our target. The gun is completely empty, all right? So now, the most important person, I think, in a gun crew is the person with the slow match. This is a slow, smoldering piece of rope. You can imagine on a wet, rainy day, what's his job? Keep that hot and ready to fire. And also, we have to protect our powder on the gun. So once this is touched off, 
Everybody covers their ears, faces away. You stay away from behind the gun. Boom! If the gun goes off, it'll jump back a little bit. Everything has to be rolled back into place, and we start the process all over again. My first object to do is have my warmer come in. He'll fish out any debris of the bag. My sponge will advance. He'll dampen his sponge. Yep, we'll keep the vent covered. Cleans out the breech of the gun. Again, we advance the cartridge and we start the process all over again. The goal is three shots in one minute. So these gun crews got to be familiar with what's going on. They've got to advance and move quickly. Uh, hello kids. Um, I'm Tom. I am the lead miner here at the fort. Uh, what I'm holding is a nice example of galena or lead ore. Uh, early settlers or early surveyors here in Sinking Valley in the 1700s discovered that there was lead here. Um, the lead mines were about a half a mile in a field from the fort. What I will do is I have a fire going in the furnace. I will lay this stone in the fire and when it achieves about 600 degrees, the lead will actually melt out of the stone. And when the fire goes out, I will have globs of lead like this in the ashes. So I will take these out of the ashes and I will collect them up, put them in a ladle or a crucible. At that point, I can pour them into an ingot. This is a one pound ingot of lead. And then I will again build another fire in the furnace, the forge, put this in the ladle or crucible and melt it down. When the lead liquefies, I have a copper dipper that I would dip into the molten lead and pour it into this ball mold. The ball lead cools and I have myself a musket ball. Now, this is, these are small, these are buckshot. This will fit my blue gun. It's a 60 caliber gun. And these are for my rifle. So these will fit every, uh, different, and if I wish, I can make BBs or shot if I wish to sh shoot shot. Next, we are going to become tinsmiths here at the fort. And this is an example of tin punching. If we were to look down at the sky, this is the shape that you would see of Fort Roberto. And with a nail and a hammer, you're going to tap out each of the dots on this tin and will make the shape of our fort. And now that you're tinsmiths, these are other examples of what you would manufacture. Tin cups were very common to be drinking out of here, so you would make be a lot of tin cups. You would make a ladle out of tin. Why tin? Tin will not rust. If you made these out of steel or iron and you got them wet, they would rust. It would taste awful. Who knows what this is? It's made of tin and you would be manufacturing these. It's a candle mold. At night, how do we see? With a lantern, it's made of tin. This is a cup to be made of tin. And who knows what this is? It's a canteen. I can tie it to my sash, fill it with water. There's no water on the top of the mountain. So, canteen filled with water. So that's what you would manufacture if you were here and as, as a tinsmith. I am the doctor at the fort of Fort Roberdale. I am not here permanently. I'm an itinerant doctor. My actual home would be in McAlevey's Fort. 
and I would need to travel from place to place. So everything you see here is portable. Everything boxes up into the boxes that you see here, uh, including everything on this table. So they can be traveled from one place to another. I would probably have at least one or two pack horses along with my regular horse that I would ride. The distance from here to McAlevey Sports is probably about 25 miles by the way the crow flies. But by travel in those, time, in those days, it would take much longer, probably uh, two thirds or three quarters of a day just to get here. So if you needed me and you had to send for me, you would send somebody and I'd be back here probably in a day and a half. So when, you, when I get here, this is my operating room. The major leaves me have this building for my, my operating room. It's equipped with bunks. This, this would have been a barracks for 12 soldiers. So you see enough bunks here right now for 12 soldiers or 12 patients. This is the surgical table. Everything that's on this table with the exception of the stuff on that side is the um, stuff that would be used for surgery. Everything from, from scalpels, scalpels to the bone saw. This saw would be used to saw off limbs after I've made the initial incision with this. Okay, the method for cutting off an arm was relatively simple. Because we had no anesthesia though, you would be given something to bite on, for example, a piece of wood or a piece of leather. Uh, we did not necessarily use a musket ball. Many believe that we did, but the musket ball, this is a musket ball, is too small. More and more than likely you would swallow it. <laughs> Once you passed out, you'd get down your throat and we'd have another problem. This particular tool has divots in it and is used to extract a musket ball because it fits in there and holds it in, in there fairly, fairly loosely. If on the other hand I was digging for an arrowhead, I would use one that looked like this which has a little bit of grooves cut in it so it has a better grip. So you grab a hold of it and can pull it out a lot easier. Some of the other things that are on this table includes my jar of leeches. Bloodletting was something that was believed to be quite common at that time. Uh, things that made you sick were bad air, bad water, and bad blood. So how do you get rid of bad blood? Well, you get something like a leech. If I can get a hold of one of them. Get something like a leech, place it on, on the individual. One leech could take about two ounces of blood. So based on my medical journals that I've read, if I needed to take out eight ounces of blood, I'd put four leeches on you. The other way of doing it would be to use this instrument. And what we would do is we would cut the vein in the wrist or in the neck. And then we'd slowly, we'd heat this cup a little bit, place that cup and as it cooled, it would create a little bit of a vacuum and help to draw. This is about, uh, this is about four ounces of blood. George Washington, when he was being bled, in, when, he is, when he was on his deathbed, they took a pint and a half of blood out of him. So you would need to fill this quite a few times. And they did that several times a day for, for poor George. One of the reasons he didn't survive his last illness, they took too much blood out of him. Some of the other tools we have here, this one is used for removing teeth. You take it, you wrap it, tightly around the tooth, give it a good twist. Once it's twisted, then you put your knee on the, on the chin or the shoulder and you twist and pull at the same time. And that will remove the tooth by the root. Once it's been removed, this object would have been laying in the fire, getting red hot here on the tip. Take the red hot, put it into the hole where the tooth came out of and basically cauterize the, the hole in the tooth, okay? This is one of my favorite tools. This tool is used for brain surgery or skull surgery. It was used to actually drill a hole in the skull. And my demonstration skull here, you can see that I've actually used it a couple of times and you see that it fits perfectly in the hole. To get it started, you would probably take a hammer and get it started and then slowly just twist and twist and twist until it actually broke through the skull. The first thing though you would have done was we would cut an X, peel the skin back so when you're done, you can put the skin back over. You would also put a silver coin. You'd shape a silver coin to fit the hole. You use silver because it didn't react with the body. 
So you pull that back over. This is for relieving the pressure if somebody had gotten hit but a, with the Indian War Club, you needed to remove bone or anything like that, you could have used that. For the amputation of a leg, we'd have used a much bigger knife than we would have, say, for the for an arm. This would have been for, for an arm. We make a full cut the whole way around. First, we tie it off with a tourniquet. It's very interesting. I've always found that, that it was interesting that we don't want you to bleed to death while we're cutting off your arm, but we'll put leeches on you later to draw blood out of you. It'll, it'll be a few years before they stop using leeches altogether, but that's going to be about another 50 years. So this is, all the, this, this is all the medical stuff, so to speak. This is my pharmacy. I am a, the apothecary. This is all of the stuff that I would use for um, giving, cre uh, creating medicines. Everything from cinnamon. This is raw cinnamon right from the, from, the, um, from the tree. This would be ground up in a mortar and pestle and mixed with something. Could be mixed with alcohol. If it's mixed with alcohol, it becomes a tincture. Tinctures means that it was mixed with alcohol. And all this is is cinnamon in alcohol. And then it was used for different types of medicine. Some of the, some of the more uh, interesting things would be things like cloves. Cloves would have been done the same way, either mixed with, either mixed with alcohol or mixed with oil. Once those two are mixed together, then they would be either put on, on teeth for, for toothache or put into the ear for ear aches. Okay, a lot of these things they still use today. So for example, some of you see stuff hanging around here drying. One of them is echinacea, which is over in that wall. Echinacea is still used today for coughs and colds. Uh, another thing that's used for coughs and colds, this is raw honey. So we would mix honey. And now we don't have lemon out here on the frontier, but we do have lemongrass. This is my lemongrass, which has something very similar to a, a lemony thing. Now, if you were a good Irish person like my mother was, there was a third ingredient that would be mixed with this, but we won't quite say what that may have been, but it probably was good Irish whiskey. That was something very common. One of the things that we did not do in 1780s medicine was we did not treat children. Children were expected to survive on their own. It was something that was just, that was the era of that time. You didn't treat the children. Who took care of the children? Usually the mother of the family. Now, what would she treat them with? The same things that I would. And she may ask my advice on what to give her child that, that had the croup or, you know, some other, some other um, melody, malady. A lot of times my, my recommendation would be to get fresh air. Remember the four things or three things that I said that made people sick was bad water, bad air, and bad blood. So if I thought it was bad air, I would suggest that a horseback ride. Every morning, get on the horse, go for a horseback ride for uh, an hour and a half. Get good fresh air. And I always say, uh, I know your mother told you once or twice, get out of the house and get some air. Get the stink blowed off you, get some fresh air. And that was a, a held over from this time period. One of the things that they would do is, is would, would recommend fresh air. Frontier medicine was extremely, extremely difficult and very tough during this time period because of what we knew about what was going on and what we didn't know. So one of the things that would always happen would be that the, that the parents, the mother would take care of you. So remember this always, remember what your mother told you to do, please do so. Hi, uh, we're here at the Fort Roberto Garden and uh, if you were here back in the 18th century on the frontier, you'd be pretty uh, self-sufficient for your needs. And one thing you would definitely have to have was food. So if you're not hunting your food or gathering your food, you're growing your food. So here in the garden, we try to uh, grow crops that they would have grown back then, some old varieties that maybe people nowadays aren't quite familiar with, and some that they are, but uh, just try to give representations of uh, everything that they might have grown. This is a display garden, so we don't grow the amount of things that they would have grown back then, but just some, just so, some ideas of the different kind of crops. We have everything from asparagus to zucchini, and we have uh, different colors of corn. A certain section of the garden we devote to the three sisters, which are corn, beans, and squash. 
And the reason they call them the three sisters is because they're all planted in the same plot of land and they all benefit each other as they grow. The corn is, a, of course, a tall grown plant, provides a trellis for beans to climb on. The beans are a legume and they fix nitrogen into the soil that helps feed the corn and the, and the squash also. And the squash has a big broad leaf plant that vines all over around the other plants, helps keep the weeds down, helps keep moisture in, and it's just uh, they benefit each other and the Native Americans would have taught the early settlers how to, how to grow crops that way. Uh, our modern day ways of planting are due because we have the modern machinery to do it. Before that existed, they just did it a lot different way. So uh, we're gonna go through how they would have used the three sisters and show you a little bit, uh, maybe some things you haven't seen before. Now our first one is corn, okay? And of course, obviously we, use corn like sweet corn or green corn that we're familiar with but we also could use uh, uh let it dry they would let it dry and then shell it off the cob and use it for smashing into meal to grind into meal and that's what uh, billy's doing here of course that would have in the 18th century that would be a hand process we didn't have machinery for that and uh, of course that the corn was picked by hand too so all the, everything would be a hand process uh, another thing to use the kernels for is hominy and what they would do with the, the kernels would be soak the kernels in wood ashes and let that sit for a while and then clean that off and then boil it until it got soft and eventually you end up with what they call hominy and ground up hominy is grits so that's where we get grits at today and other parts of the uh, corn they would have used would be the husk and for people, when I ask people what do you use husks for, the first thing they say is, well, corn husk dolls. And well, that's true. Let me make your toys out of corn husks. Uh, they could also uh, twist them and use them to weave. I make a, my chair seeds made out of corn husks there. They're also pretty good for, uh, for kindling to start fires with. So something we would think we just throw away, they have a use for. And then the cobs also, once you have your corn off the cob, Cobs would make good start kindling for starting fires. So that's just uh, another way of using some things that they uh, didn't throw anything out. And they also grew popcorn. This small corn here is uh, popcorn that we're familiar with and they would have had it back then also. And then the beans, we uh, planted lots of different varieties of beans you see here. Uh, some of them with some pretty interesting names. There's uh, Pinto beans and Appaloosa beans and Jacob's cattle beans, mainly named for animals because of the spots on the beans. And there's lots of different uh, varieties. And they're very easy to grow and they're a good thing for uh, young people to grow in their gardens because they're real easy to grow and they're real easy to uh, save the seed from. And I, I didn't mention that's an important thing about our garden is we try to save as many seeds as we can from year to year. So we're not going out buying seeds. We're using the crops we had from before and saving the seeds and, and using them year after year. So the beans, we would eat green, like we're familiar with green beans, or you got green shell beans where the beans are mature, but the pods are still green, or Billy's showing out some dried beans that we could uh, leave dry on the vine. I have a sample here. We just pull the stalk out and let the beans hang till they dry, and then you shell them out so you're ready to uh, ready to eat them and of course when you're ready to eat them you have to soak them in water for a while to get them soft again and then cook them and you can have your beans that way and then our last of the three sisters was a squash or gourds uh, similar uh, they squash similar to what we would call a butternut squash uh, the orange flesh is, kind of looks like a pumpkin but also they would use gourds and you see here we've got a gourds using a lot of different things Gourds aren't edible, but they used them, would use them for containers because back at that time, uh, they didn't have a lot of plastic or even a lot of glass. So what they had, they could make themselves either with a basket or maybe a wood container. But this was just another thing that would help them uh, have containers. Uh, I have one here I'd like to show. It's just, I think it looks like a ladle. It wouldn't be hard to just take that top off and use it for a ladle because they use bowls. And I have one here that I actually keep water in to use for a canteen. If you just line that with, uh, line it with either paraffin or beeswax so the water doesn't penetrate the side and you can use it for a water container. And uh, this one here we're using to, for a storage container to store beans in. I think it's a good, good way to keep, uh, keep bugs and animals out of your 
food. You can put corn or beans in there. And we're gonna show you how we would uh, clean out a gourd like that because we need it nice and clean in there. If we're gonna put things we're gonna eat inside the gourd, we don't want a lot of dirt and, and seeds inside. So you see now we've been shaking around and there's seeds in there. So we cut the top off and we have a little trick. We throw the some stones inside here. And what that does is loosen up all the, there's a cluster of seeds in there. They're not just laying in there loose and there's a lot of fiber that holds it together. Let me shake it up real good. You want to dump it out in the bowl and see if we get any seeds out of there. And then plus to that, we can, uh, if we get seeds, shake it up and uh, we can get seeds out and the seeds we can use to plant. One way of cleaning out. So we do that over and over and over again until nothing comes out. And then we'll put something smaller like uh, maybe uh, like shot, like BBs in there to clean it out. And then we'll put sand in and even make it even smoother yet. So eventually we have a perfectly clean inside there and we're not afraid to put something in there that we're gonna eat. And uh, also this early in the year, we have uh, planted already. We have onions and some lettuce and the early greens, things like that. And later on, we'll do uh, the, the later tomatoes and carrots and peppers and beets and things like that. Colonial children on the frontier didn't have a lot of time for fun and games, but like all children through all times, they did enjoy playing games and toys when they had their chores done. So some of the toys that you see here on my table are toys that colonial children played with. And if you think about it, you're still playing with some of these games today. For example, do you play checkers? How about the ball and cup? This is a game of skill. Oh, I'm not very good at it. And every, you know, every child enjoys playing with a ball. How about marbles? Hmm, do you still play with marbles? Tops. Tops were popular in colonial times. How about this game? This looks like Today is bowling, but um, we call it nine pins in colonial times. And if you count the pins, there's nine there instead of the 10 in modern bowling. And it's a tabletop game. How about ring toss? Oh, I got that one. So uh, we still play ring toss today. Um, this marble game is a marble solitaire game that you, um, start with one empty space and then you just keep jumping the marbles until as many marbles as um, you can get. You want to get down to the least number of marbles to win this solitaire game. Another um, toy that you may not be familiar with is this toy called Jacob's Ladder. This is the way it works. And the reason it's called Jacob's Ladder is because during colonial, colonial times, the Bible was a very important book that children learned to read from. So they knew their Bible stories. And there's a story in the Old Testament about Jacob who had a dream of a ladder coming down from heaven. So that's why this is called Jacob's Ladder. But you can also use it to tell other stories. If I wanted to tell a story about a house, I could make it look like a house. I could also make it look like a man. There he is. There's our man that we can tell a story with Jacob's Ladder. So as you look at these toys and think about um, how they're made and compare them to your toys today, what, lots of metal and plastic, especially plastic. But if you look at what these toys are made of, it's all natural materials that they had on hand. So the checker game is just a piece of board painted, and the checkers are made of corn cobs, sliced and dry. Another toy that's made from corn is the corn husk doll. Of course, all, to, all girls like to play with dolls, I guess. So in these uh, colonial times, the dolls were, could be made of corn husks. And the marbles, they could be either glass 
or clay. Especially out on the frontier, if you didn't have access to more expensive glass marbles, you could make your marbles out of clay. Here with the ring toss, it's made of wood and rope. So um, you can see that um, the things were made with natural materials that they had on hand. But also think about how are these toys powered? How do these toys run? You, you power these tools because there's no electricity, no internet. You power the tools as you, toys as you play with them. Welcome to our frontier home. Here on the frontier, survival depends on preserving food to last us from the end of October until the beginning of May. There's no refrigeration here. There's no electricity. So we have to use other ways to preserve our food through the winter months. Our garden produces the food that we need, or our husbands and fathers can hunt and trap for meat with uh, deer or um, squirrels or rabbits, but all this food needs to be preserved through the winter. Now there's four ways that we do that. We do drying, pickling, salting, and smoking. So we're going to show you how we do all those things. We're starting here with drying apples. Apples are critical for here on the frontier because there's so many things we can do with apples. These are dried apples. These will be air dried in a warm oven. And this is our oven. We'll, we'll bake in the oven and as the oven cools down, we can put this, this tray slides in here and that warm air will dry out the apples. We also preserve through pickling. Now we have here a cucumber. The cucumber is used to make pickles. The, vinegar, the apples, apples are really important because you can make apple cider and you drink apple cider in the fall. I'm sure you've had that in the fall. But apple cider can be left to ferment to become vinegar. And when you smell that vinegar, you know you've got vinegar, right? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. You can smell the vinegar. So the vinegar then, the uh, cucumbers are sliced and preserved in vinegar, and then the cucumbers become pickles. We can also preserve beets. These are beets from our garden, and from those we can make pickled beets, and uh, we'll have some chickens here on the frontier, so we'll have some eggs, and we can make pickled beets. So you can see how when you go from the apple to the cider to the vinegar, apples are really important on the frontier. Now another drying method is this is a way to preserve some of our vegetables. These are our green beans from the garden, and these are dried by stringing them on a thread through the needle. The fresh beans, again, they're, hu they're hung in a place that has warm, dry air circulating. So we're not going to cook them, but we'll hang them near the fire, and that will dry them out. Then we have our meats. And meats, you know, they, fresh meat can spoil very quickly. So one way to preserve meat is to salt it. And this is an example of salted beef. And if you look closely, you can see the grains of salt in it. And what you do, this is the salt. So once the meat is uh, butchered and cut up, it's packed in salt in barrels. The salt draws the moisture out of the meat and dries it up. Now another way to preserve meat is jerky. And that's a smoking process. 
And that's actually something that um, the early settlers learned from the Native Americans, that you, draw, that you cut up the strips of meat, it, it, they do have some salt in them to help cure them, but to dry them out, they're hung near a smoky fire, not in the fire because you don't want to cook it, but near the fire, warm, dry air circulating is what dries out the meat. I think we're going to eat pretty well here this winter. So the year is 1778. What types of chores do you think someone your age would be doing here on the frontier at the fort? We're gonna be milking the cow, making butter, carrying water, and foraging for our lunch. Sounds good? All right, let's get started. Milk the cow, first thing. This is Bossy, and she is our fake cow, and we're going to be milking her. And let me just tell you what to do, and then everybody's gonna get a turn trying to do it. Pretend that your finger is the cow's teat. That's the hangy down part of the udder, and what you wanna do is put the teat in the crook between your thumb and your pointy finger, and you wanna squeeze down, one, two, three. If you do it right, you can feel the blood at the end of your finger. So we want to do it with the teats. So we're going to set our bucket. We're going to squat down, stick the bucket between our knees, and then crawl into the cow. Nice, bossy. So you want, want to treat her gently, and then grab the teats and squeeze. Sque oh, and you got to hit the bucket. Squeeze, squeeze. Squeeze, let the teat fill up and squeeze some more, squeeze. So you do that till the bucket's all filled up. Now that we've milked the cow, it is, actually we wait a little bit for the cream to rise to the top of the bucket and then we skim off that cream, we put it in a churn and then we start agitating it. And what happens is cream is, has a lot of fat in it. And what we do when we do the churn, or in this case, we're gonna be shaking a jar so you can see it, is the fat that's in the cream, we're gonna to stick together, stick it together, stick it together, stick it together, and it becomes a bigger and bigger and bigger ball of fat, and that ball of fat we call butter. So, for modern sensibilities, I'm going to use a jar, well, because it's clean, and number two, you can see it, and I'm also going to use cream that we bought at the store. Back in 1778, they didn't bother to pasteurize anything like we do now. So I'm actually going to eat this butter for supper tonight. So I want to, it to be nice and clean. So pour in the cream. Cap the jar really, really super tight. And we start to shake. Shake and shake and shake. And if you sing a little song, it's not quite so boring. Anyway, those little fat globules are being stuck together, stuck together, stuck together. And then after a while, what we have is butter. Butter swimming in buttermilk. Can you see that? Doesn't that look good? I'm going to pour off this buttermilk so you can see it better. Pour off the buttermilk. And what we have is globs of butter. Add a little salt to that, and it will keep really, really well. So, we've made butter today. Our next chore is carrying water. We're lucky enough to live near a, a stream. We haven't had time to dig a well yet, but this is how you do it. You throw your bucket into the deepest part of the stream. So I'm aiming for right about there. And then fill it up, hand over hand without spilling it. And we pour it into the bucket. Okay, it looks like we got two pretty full buckets. That's probably about, oh, maybe 20 pints. 
So a pint's a pound the world around. How much does this weigh? Right, 20 pounds. That's for each bucket, so 20 times two. What's that? Right, so what we wanna do is we put the yoke, whoops. We put the yoke on our back. We control the hooks because, oh man, because we don't want these buckets to be swinging around. You could probably kill somebody that way. And we bring the bucket back up to the house. It's near mid-morning. We got to get some greens for our supper. So this is garlic mustard. Uh, in today's world, it's considered a horrible invasive plant, but it came from Europe and back in the day, it was considered a really good pot herb, something like spinach that you would boil and then eat. That would really go good with our butter. So all you do is pick it, pick it and pick it and pick it. And don't want the roots. That would cause a lot of dirt. Don't want stems. Stick it in the basket and pick some more. This is kind of old. It would be a little bit bitter, but if that was the only green we had to eat this time of year, we would certainly pick it. Our last chore of the morning is going to be some grinding some corn. We're going to make cornbread to go with our butter and use the buttermilk in our cornbread and then have some good old greens with that. Does that sound good? Okay, to grind corn, this is whole corn right here. And we harvested it last fall. And what we want to do is we want to put some in the corn grinder here. Here we go, can use that in the outhouse. We're gonna cover it with some burlap so it doesn't go flying all over the place. And then pound and pound and pound and pound and pound, 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 pound. Keep doing that. And as you can see, it's starting to break up. And we're gonna be doing this for a really long time before we get some flour in it. So we've worked hard today. Milked the cow, made butter, got water for the kettle, um, pounded corn, making some cornbread. We've worked all morning for just lunch. So. What I want you to do when you go have your lunch, and it's about lunchtime, is I want you to think about food and all the work that goes into food. Here in the United States, we waste an awful lot of food. And that work that, makes, that goes into making food comes at a cost, cost of work for the farmers, and also at a cost of climate change for, uh, for the whole world. So, I guess the message is, enjoy your food, be appreciative of where it comes from, and don't waste it. Oh, where do your loyalties lie? I need to know, friend or foe. We're out here in the Pennsylvania frontier. A third of the people, they're smart like me. We're loyalists. We know that King George is here to help us. That other third, which could be you, you are a rebel. You call yourself patriots, you don't know what you're talking about. There's another third, those are the ones that don't know what's going on. Where do you lie? Well, I guess I can trust you a little bit. A lot of people ask me why I'm a loyalist. Taxes are low. Roads are in good repair. We've got the king supporting us. We're part of the most powerful empire in the entire world. Why ever would we want to join up and destroy what we have? This is our land. You call yourself Americans? That's fine. We're Americans too. 
You have to figure out which way you want to go. But I know for me, I'm staying with the king. He'll keep us safe and we'll be strong. And the most important thing, he's going to leave me alone out here. He's going to let me do what I want to do. He's not going to interfere. We're not going to have all those people from Philadelphia coming in here. Instead, we're going to have land here. We can grow a good life here. So stay with us. Be loyal to the crown. It's what you need to do. Well, thank you for coming to Fort Robert uh, today. I hope you had a great time. And just to make sure that we covered everything for you, I'm gonna go over those three quiz questions again. Number one, what is the nickname of Fort Roberto? Yes, that's right, the lead mine fort. Question two, what makes our fort look a little different from other forts? Yes, that's right, it's the horizontal logs that make us look unique. And question number three, the toughest question is your vocabulary word. What are those diamond shaped corners called in the fort? Very good, bastion. And that are the main points as you take away your experience here at Fort Roberdow.